Architectural plans are extremely easy to read when you understand the code behind them. What's going on guys? My name is David Tomich and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, firstly, thank you so much for joining me. On this channel, we talk all things architecture and technology. Today, we're going through how architectural plans are drawn and how you can read them as somebody who isn't potentially involved in the architecture industry 24 seven, but you might be building your own home, you might be doing a renovation, or you might just simply have an interest in architecture. Download this construction PDF off the internet, and today I'm gonna to walk you through exactly what you need to be looking for to understand every single bit of detail. So starting off with the site plan, the site plan is basically a contextual overview of everything you need to know about the project and where it's situated. Most of the time, you're gonna have some sort of boundary lines around the side. In this case, they're quite evident because we have setback lines directly from the boundary to the corner of the building. All these little lines going through the page, which are usually grayed out in some form or some fashion, are generally indicating the contours of the site. And by contours, I mean how that site is falling up and down, left and right. If you don't get enough information from these contour lines, you also have these individual small little hotspots. So if I was to zoom right in, you'd see that that is 6.755 above the Australian height datum, which is a standard measurement here in Australia. So understanding that, we know that it's 6.755 at that back left corner. And if I go to the front right corner, it's 9.5. 208 which means we have almost a three and a half meter fall from the back left hand corner to the bottom right hand corner of this page just by simply looking at these hot spots we can understand how the levels and how the ground works we can't always build on flat sites we can't always have a perfect luxury of that so sometimes we will have a lot of contour lines over the page continuing on into the page and the actual architecture itself the proposed driveway here is going to be some sort of concrete which is indicated by the dots throughout that actual texture so there is a series of universally accepted and recognized hatches for architectural drawings so everybody can consistently know what they're looking at by simply having a quick look. The rest of this page basically just tells us where things are in proportion to the boundary lines and where they sit on that block itself. So overall, this page is really just telling us where the house sits and how high up it is. Moving down to the ground floor plan, we start understanding what the actual internals of the house look like. So if I was to zoom in to the corner of this wall here, we could see that this is a timber frame wall and that right here, for example, that door is a 820 door, which means it has an opening leaf of 820 millimeters. We have a few critical bits of information here that we need to understand when looking at the ground floor plan. First of all, we have our elevation markers, which are always represented on the outside of the building, looking in towards. So if I was to look at E01, that is basically looking front on at that building if we were only to see it in a 2D flat elevation point of view. So we can recognize the difference between a section and an elevation by simply utilizing the E01 marker or the E02 marker, understanding that the E stands for elevation. Then on the other hand, we have our section markers, which are sometimes represented as an S01 or they are lettered in this case. So here we have an A, we have a B and we have a C. Each one of these markers is quickly indicating to you what page it can be found on. Now, obviously this page has been completely desensitized and there's no information because it comes readily on the internet, but we can see that section B can be found on A06. So in that instance, it would most likely be the sixth page for this project here. So if we were to talk about the dimensions on the outside, the house is usually broken up into quadrants. So everything on the bottom of the page will annotate everything on half of that building towards the bottom. The top reflects the top half and the left and right dimensions usually reflect that building split in half, again, looking at it on each representative side. In this instance, it is a very simple building. There isn't a vast amount of information that we need multiple, multiple layers of dimensions. It's relatively simple. So if I was to zoom into this top section of the building, we can see that these dimensions are working from the outside in. So starting with the 930, it's basically telling you from the edge of the wall to that window, which is window 06 in this instance, we have 930 mil and then that window is 2.41 wide. Moving back to the next dimension line, we're talking about the actual internals of the building. So they are clearly marked here with bed one, bed one, so you know exactly what you're looking at and it isn't hard to read. Looking at this simply, we know it's a 90 millimeter stud wall. It is 4.1 meters wide for the bedroom and then again another 90 millimeter stud wall 
followed by a 2.2 meter walk-in robe and then the kitchen living dining spaces. We can continue to read this set of plans accordingly, moving further and further out and further and further in, depending on how the dimension lines work themselves. On the ground floor plan, there isn't too much more that you really need to understand and know. Most of it is quite graphical and quite informative, so we can actually see what we're looking at. We know that picture is very universal for a toilet. We know that's very universal for a bath, a shower, a hand basin, a trough, and then a washing machine. So some things are very just generic and very universal, so we don't really have to explain them too much. Some things that usually aren't clearly indicated on most architectural plans and some people don't understand what they're looking at is our actual understanding of the RLs and the finished floor levels. So in this instance, we know that this dining room is at plus zero zero and so is the garage. There is no step down between these two, so therefore if you're walking in from your garage, to your main living space, it's completely flush in the concrete. In some instances, you will notice a minor symbol in the garage or a minor symbol somewhere in the house to indicate a sunken area or potentially a positive symbol to say plus 500, that way you know you're gonna to need to take some steps up to get to that space. Now, continuing on with the elevation markers, if we were to look at these elevation markers, we'd see E1 and E2. Moving to the next page, we'll again see E1 and E2 on each side. That's basically indicating to us that E1 is E1 at the top and E2 is E2 on the left hand side. Looking at E2 as a basic understanding of an elevation, what we really are looking for is the architectural expression on the outside. So elevations will tell you predominantly about textures, materials, colors, rather than anything structural. In this instance, we do sometimes speak about the roof pitches because it's simple and easy to understand in this instance, but most of the time we're just talking about actual architectural aluminum frames and James Hardy Axon cladding on the outside. It does also tell us the heights of our windows and the overall sill height too, so it is an added bit of information that we get from the elevation. Sometimes our elevations will come in color, most of the time they'll come in black and white, it really depends on the architectural firm. For me personally, I'll have both black and white and color elevations to make sure that no information is missed across the board. The next page again represents the exact same information but of the two separate elevations. At the same time, on this elevation three, we have two new lines. So we have an FGL, which is a future ground level, and we have an NGL, which is a natural ground level. Understanding that most of the time when you're reading an elevation, the natural ground level is an indication from the boundary line itself. Where the house actually sits could be very different and it is also indicated if there is a huge difference in that natural ground level on this elevation. So now just looking at this set of plans, I can see that there is quite a large amount of sand required to fill up this block to be able to actually build this house flat. So the natural ground level is quite low. The new ground level when all that sand comes in is gonna be significantly higher. We can also understand what our ceiling height is gonna be throughout that house. And in this instance, it is very basic, it is very simple. We're going zero to 2.7. So we know that our ceiling level in that house is going to be 2.7 meters throughout. The next page is very similar to our elevations. It is now our structural sections. So if I just scroll back up to my floor plan and zoom into one of my sectional details, section A on page A06, we don't have any pages. We know that it is section six, so now coming back to those sections, section A right here will indicate to us all sorts of structural information. So if I zoom in to this section here, we know that the slab on the outside porch is one course down, so 86 millimeters, compared to the entry itself. We know we have some sort of curved cornices and we know our ceiling sits at 2.7 above. Understanding generic architectural expression, we can also see that we're showing timber frames in this instance. Timber frames are shown with a simple box and a cross, whereas metal stud purlins are shown more indicatively of the shape they are. So if it's a C purlin, it'll be drawn as a C. If it's a Z, you'll see a Z. I can also understand that this squiggly line up the top is a form of insulation. So we're gonna need some sort of bulk insulation up the top. And we also have a truss holding up our entire roof. Now I can make that assumption or I can go across to the actual annotations on this document, which will tell me that we're using bulk ceiling insulation on top 
We're using 10 millimeter plaster boards and we also have a termite management system underneath the slab as well. So each individual line is usually annotated in some way, shape or form in a section. This is a very basic section. There isn't a lot of information going on. Sometimes you might also have a sectional detail marker, which is gonna be a dashed outline with a little D01 next to it as an instance. For example, this box gutter would be something I would detail very heavily so that people understood exactly how it was to be built. Whereas in this instance, they're just relying on the builder to be able to provide some sort of box gutter to be able to then actually drain away that water from the roof. But at the same time, speaking about that roof and speaking about that box gutter, looking at that section, we can tell that that upstand is completely hiding that roof. So that whole section of roof is completely concealed. Now there is some ambiguity in this set of documentation because you can see a minus one course here. Whereas when we went back to our original floor plan, that floor plan did not reflect any set down in that garage. So this documentation set isn't perfect. It has some errors, which we've already picked up on, but it's a good way to understand architectural documentation. This next section is exactly the same as the one above. It just goes into some different elements of the construction and the house, and we just really start understanding how the building works itself. Now, as an architect, I can pick up more errors in this documentation. For example, that timber stud going all, all the way to the ground will completely rot out, but that isn't my judgment call to make on this set of drawings. Moving further on, we can start seeing our roof plan. Our roof plan is a very basic understanding of what we really need to know. There's not too much that goes on a roof plan. Usually there's some hips and some valleys. There's some sort of truncation that goes along. In this instance, all we can see is a number of vents, the extents of the building below and what kind of roof sheeting we're using. We can also get an understanding of how that roof is gonna go. So one's gonna fall that way, another one's gonna fall that way, and the last one is gonna fall back the same direction. So in this instance, this roof plan is merely just telling us some basic information of how each roof falls, where the gutters are, where the barges are, and what each individual item is. Next, we have an, our electrical plan, which is a little bit more in depth and a little harder to understand if you don't know what you're looking at. In this instance, I have no sort of electrical legend, so I'm guessing there'd be some sort of documentation to go with this actual set of plans. But if I was to zoom in and use an educated guess of what's going on, we can see that in this toilet, we have our dashed line to our light switch, which also connects to our exhaust fan. So that indicates to me that one light switch will trigger both your fan and your exhaust fan at the exact same time. Whereas in this bathroom, for instance, we have one going to the exhaust fan and another going to the light switch. So that means I can turn on my light and turn on my exhaust at separate times, not at once. Now this is something that's really easy to pick up on a set of plans and it might be something that bugs you in person. So if you can read a set of electrical plans like this on a very basic house, you can understand that you do not want one switch for both sets of items. You want two switches and that is sometimes dependent on the national construction code and the regulations behind it. So the same principle applies to the rest of the house where the lines basically end is where that switch is going to be, how those switches work. So that's a three-way switch, which means three points on the wall, you can turn it off and on. A two-way switch, you can turn it off and on on two points. And then we have our power points down below. So 350 millimeters above the ground, We'll have a double GPO, two double GPOs down here. Then it appears like some sort of aerial antenna connection to the theater, which makes plenty of sense. And then the same information on the bedrooms and the en-suites. So in this ensuite toilet here, for example, we do have our two lines to two different connections, which means we can turn that light on, we can turn that exhaust fan on, we don't have to turn on both at the same time. Overall, that is the basic understanding of the electrical plan. Again, there would be some sort of legend to tell me what that light is, what that light is, what that light is, and what every single annotation is on this page. However, we don't have that information in this instance. So we're just guessing and assuming based on general knowledge that that in the middle of a living room would be a light globe on the ceiling. Now our next page appears to be some sort of internal room elevations and internal room layouts. So basically what they've done is they've cropped one section of that building to basically give you a lot more information about what needs to happen. So in this instance, K1 is looking very similar as an elevation, just being an internal elevation into the kitchen. 
and K2 is looking backwards towards the island bench. We again see some dimensions wrapping around this kitchen layout to basically annotate a bit more so we know what's going on in a bit more depth, same as the internal elevations. Now we can see that we're going to have drawers, an oven, a couple cupboards and a dishwasher recess, a big window and an exposed range hood. So that information you can't actually understand from looking at a floor plan, you do need to see it in some sort of 2D elevation or 3D annotation so you can actually understand what's going on. So these sorts of drawings are actually extremely useful and a lot of the time they are missed in architectural firms. So usually the client will just say, no, nope, don't need them, I'll sort that out myself. But when a builder goes to build it, they have no idea what they're doing. So this really helps people price it and helps them know what they're building. Similar to how we looked at this kitchen layout, we can look at this bathroom layout. We only have one B1 looking basically directly back. So if we zoom into this B1 section, we can get quite a bit of information. Basically assuming from the information that I'm given here, I can understand and analyze that the light gray shaded patches would be some sort of tiles. And then the white bits would just be painted wall or painted gyprock. There isn't too much information on this internal room elevation but a lot of it can be assumed. I'm guessing this CWT would reference back to, again, some sort of external document, same as that shower, same as the mirror two. So you'd have a set of specifications that would say, this CWT is a 600 by 1200 tile or whatever the instance might be. And again, looking front on, we can understand we have two cupboards, two drawers, 200 millimeters of tiles upstand and then a mirror above. So that simple internal elevation gives us a lot of information that sometimes wouldn't be portrayed at all in a 2D floor plan at all. Anyway, that is all for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned everything you were looking for here in this one video today. If you did, make sure you smash that like button down below. If you truly loved it, make sure you smash the subscribe button. And like always, I'll see you next Monday.